I'm happy to be here to talk to you about the work that's going on in my lab and some other labs, trying to relate concepts that have been sort of dancing around each other for quite some time and sort of unify them into one way that we can study something that has been a big problem in both the United States and throughout the world, and that is the obesity epidemic. So let me give you a little bit of an outline of what I plan to discuss. I want to talk about some of the factors that contribute to the obesity epidemic. I'm also going to give a little bit of background on food reward and some of the associated brain systems that come into play when we talk about the rewarding aspects of food and the rewarding aspects of eating. I'm also going to then talk a little bit about the concept of addiction. And we tend to think about addiction in terms of drug addiction, but in reality, addiction can be to many different things. So I'm going to talk about what are the properties of addiction and what are we talking about when we talk about addiction versus simply just normal rewarding experiences, because there is a fine line. I'm then going to talk about some of the data that has come out of my lab and some other labs, looking at addiction-linked behaviors that have been emerging in response to food, and particularly in response to palatable foods. And these are largely derived from studies using animal models. And then I will spend a little bit of time talking about some of the more recent studies that have been done trying to measure this concept of food addiction, if you will, in clinical populations. And then if there's time, hopefully we can talk about some conclusions and some next steps, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions. So as you know, the big problem that we're facing in the United States is the obesity epidemic. Approximately 65% of adults are overweight, of which approximately one-third of them are obese. And so this is clearly a large problem that we need to come up with novel treatments for. Not only is being obese comorbid with a variety of different health concerns, such as heart disease and diabetes and some types of cancer, but there are also interesting psychological, economic, and social consequences to being obese. And so this is certainly a multifaceted type of disorder that affects people on multiple levels. This isn't just about the health aspects, but also about the psychological well-being and societal issues as well. So why are so many people overweight? Well, there's a few different things that come into play. One of the things that's been discussed is this idea of portion size or portion creep, if you will. And so this is depicted in, um, oh, sorry. Hold on. I broke something. <laughs> Excuse me for one second. Okay, I'm back, back online. Um, so again, this is something that's been depicted in some of these images here, where you can see that 20 years ago, the size of a hamburger was clearly much smaller than it is in the modern day hamburger situation. Also, an example of um, sugar sweetened beverages, for this example, this isn't meant to pick on Coca-Cola by no means. Um, you could put any sugar sweet beverage up here. The sizes of them have gone up dramatically over the years. And so it's important to understand that not only are the sizes of these things going up, um, but the amount that people are consuming as a result is also going up. Another issue that relates to obesity and uh, one factor that could be part of the problem is that food acquisition is somewhat easier than it used to be. And so this is an image that's meant to depict our primitive ancestors. We evolved from hunters and gatherers. You used to have to hunt for your food or find a berry bush or find your food. And back then, it was ideal to eat a lot of food when it was available because you didn't know when you might get your next meal. But that's not really the case these days. We can very easily and very readily, most of us at least, can get access to food. And, um, it's easy to store it, and it's easy to procure it. And so I want to point out that obesity is an endpoint. It has multiple contributing factors, some of which I've just described, but there are a variety of other things. As we know from some of the earlier talks on the topic of this particular meeting, there are genetic disorders that are also associated with obesity that can contribute to that. Um, there are also issues related to lifestyle, um, genetic vulnerability toward obesity. So this isn't just a behavioral effect and this isn't just an environmental effect. It's a variety of issues that are collapsing together to contribute to this syndrome of obesity as we know it. And so the question that I pose to you tonight and that I hope we can discuss further is where does food reward fit into this? Where does the fact that food tastes good, that people sometimes eat simply because they like the taste of the food, not necessarily because they're hungry? 
So this is where we come to the term hedonic eating versus caloric need. And so we know that we're supposed to eat food because we need calories. That's the purpose of food. We need to provide ourselves with energy so we can sustain ourselves. But it turns out that some people eat because they want to eat, not necessarily because they have to eat. And this is where hedonic overeating or eating for pleasure comes into play. And so it turns out that the foods that are rich in fats and sugars are the ones that people like to eat for pleasure because they happen to taste good. And also, it turns out that those are the ones that happen to be high in calories, often high in empty calories. And by that, I mean that they're high in calories, but they don't have much nutritional value aside from the fact that they are just sources of energy. So another issue is that palatable food has become somewhat ubiquitous for most people in our society. From that image I just showed of people grocery shopping, you can, I'm sure, imagine from your own experience, when you go into a supermarket, it seems that the aisles that are available to you now that contain cookies and crackers and these palatable types of junk food, if you will, seem to be growing and growing. And so we have access to these things more readily. You can pretty much go anywhere and get access to food. We tend to uh, meet with our friends around food. It's become more a part of our social life than it has in the past. It's also become apparent that people tend to eat for reasons other than the fact that they're hungry. And so we're supposed to eat because we're getting signals sent up from our gut that are telling us that we need to give ourselves some energy. But people report that they eat because they're bored or they're stressed or they're lonely or they're upset. And so there's emotional reasons why people eat. And all these things can contribute to eating in order to feel good or in order to make yourself um, feel better via food. So the question is, what happens in the brain when we eat? And so this is a very, very simplified diagram of um, a human brain showing just some, some, excuse me, just some of the brain pathways that are activated in response to food intake. Particularly, this is showing some of the brain pathways that are activated in response to food intake that also happen to be activated in response to drug use. And so these are reward-related brain systems in the brain. And it turns out that part of the reason why drugs of abuse are so reinforcing and so pleasurable and make people feel so good is that they're actually hijacking the brain. They're working on these primitive brain systems that were put in place to reinforce natural behaviors, like eating. We need to eat, so it makes sense that our brains were designed in order to make us eat, to make food taste good. And so we have drugs of abuse really usurping these biological pathways that were put in place to reinforce natural behaviors. And so the circuitry is certainly in place in that we have this overlap existing among food intake and drug intake. And so we'll talk a little bit about, about that in a few minutes, but I want to go over, when I talk about the term addiction, when we're talking about drugs of abuse, what exactly does it mean to be considered addicted to something? And so the dsm 4 is a Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And this is a book that psychiatrists and medical doctors can use to diagnose all the different psychiatric disorders that are out there. And it simply sets the criteria so that we can understand how to diagnose different types of disorders that exist. So in the dsm 4 the diagnostic criteria for drug addiction is actually considered substance dependence. And so there are a variety of different criteria that one must meet in order to be considered dependent on a drug of abuse or to be classified as a drug addict, and those are shown here. You don't have to meet all of them. You have to meet at least three for an extended period of time. And so you can see that there are these criteria that scientists can now use to measure whether or not someone is addicted to something, and most of the time this is addicted to drugs of abuse. So the question that's arisen in my lab and you know, in other labs throughout the country is, we know that there's this overlapping brain circuitry among drugs and food, and we know that there are these criteria to diagnose someone as being addicted to drugs. What if people, particularly people who are obese, could be addicted to food in the way that some people become addicted to drugs. And certainly if you're addicted to food, that out of control type of eating could be adding to obesity and could be resulting in increased body weight that may be out of the control of the individual to some extent. So before I go into some of the data that suggests that food might resemble a drug on some levels, I think it's important to point out that foods and drugs are normally very, very different. So we know that we need foods to survive. But we don't need hyperpalatable junk type foods that are the ones that people tend to overeat. But nonetheless, we do need food to survive. We don't, on the other hand, need drugs of abuse. 
you can, most people can survive without drugs of abuse. Um, also, food is not regulated. We don't, we have the, obviously we have regulations over the, the safety of our food, but in terms of how much you're allowed to eat, when you can buy it, where you can buy it, it's at your leisure. You're allowed to buy as much food as you like. Um, eating is also socially acceptable. People are encouraged to meet over meals and get together around food. It's not something that people look down upon. If you bring donuts into the office, you're usually the hero, not demonized. Um, on the other hand, drugs of abuse are illegal. There's certainly lots of laws in place regarding them and discouraging their use. As a society, we tend to look down upon drug addicts and don't necessarily encourage them to bring their drugs into the office. Um, in terms of the neurochemistry, I want to point out that I'm giving a very simplified overview of some of the neurochemicals that are perturbed by both food intake and um, by drug of abuse, drugs of abuse. I'm going to highlight just a couple that we've been studying in my group. One of them is dopamine. And so we've been studying mesolimbic dopamine systems. Um, dopamine, with respect to food, is involved with the motivation to eat. And so with food, dopamine release occurs, but it's more associated with the novelty of a food. So the very first time you eat a food that you've never tasted before, dopamine is released in reward-related regions of the brain. And this is not so much due to the rewarding aspects of the food, but because of another function of dopamine, which has to do with orienting. So people often think that dopamine and reward are synonymous, and that's not exactly true. Dopamine is really associated with learning. And so we want to make sure that the very first time we eat a food that we've never tasted, we remember that experience. Because if it turns out that that food made us awfully sick, we want to make sure we never ever eat that food again. It's a, a safety issue. It could save our life by, for instance. So dopamine with respect to food is released upon a novel food. But once you've had that same food over and over again in your brain and your body learn that it's relatively safe, the dopamine release is usually attenuated. Now on the other hand, one of the hallmarks of drugs of abuse is that every time a drug of abuse is administered, be it morphine, cocaine, alcohol, it's releasing dopamine in the nucleus accumbens and other reward-related brain regions. And so that's one of the key differences that we see between foods and drugs is that foods don't always release dopamine, drugs do. I'm also going to say a little bit about opioid systems in the brain. So opioid systems in our brain have to do with um, pleasurable aspects or the wanting and liking of different types of foods and also the wanting and liking of drugs. Well, there are antagonists that block opioid receptors in the brain. And if you have a person addicted to drugs or an animal in the lab addicted to a drug and you give them a drug that will block those opioid receptors, it will put the animal or the person into a state of withdrawal. And you can measure that and they'll show shakes and tremors and all different other behaviors associated with a withdrawal syndrome. But if you give that drug to someone who's just eating food or to a rat who's just eating food, normally it won't do anything to them. And so opioid antagonists will precipitate withdrawal in opiate addicted animals and people. So I'm going to say a little bit about some of the animal model work that we've been doing, and then I'll talk a little bit about the clinical studies that go along with these and really support some of the early findings that have been obtained with the lab animals. And so as I said earlier, just like obesity is a multifaceted disorder, the types of foods that people tend to overeat are also multifaceted. And so I'm going to talk about the concept of food as it might relate to addiction within the construct of a few different areas. And so I'll tell you about some data that looks at overeating of sugars and fats, so we're interested in understanding overeating are the types of foods that people tend to overeat, which tend to be high in sugar and high in fats, to understand the effects of the specific macronutrients. Also talk a little bit about junk food. There are some studies that I'll describe in which we simply give rats junk food from the grocery store, um, all the stuff that we like to eat. Um, also talk a little bit about whether or not an animal is obese or lean and how that affects these behaviors that we're observing. And I'll say a little bit about how the variety of foods that are available can influence some of these behaviors. So there's a difference between having just one single type of palatable food available and having a whole slew of different foods to choose from. So what we've done is we've adapted those criteria that I showed you earlier for substance dependence to simplify them so that we can study them in the animal models. And so we can look at binging or overconsumption of a particular food. Then we can look at withdrawal which is characterized in the case of opiates by a clear syndrome that we can measure in the rat. And it's similar to what you'd see in a human. And this is characterized by shakes and tremors and some changes in the brain that are also um, measurable. And I'll discuss in a minute. 
Following the withdrawal period, there's a state of craving, and so an animal will ex exhibit behaviors that suggest that they really want to get access to a particular drug, or in our case, a particular food, um, and they'll be willing to engage in behaviors that might seem sort of out of the ordinary for a normal animal. I'll also say a little bit about another characteristic that can be used to assess addiction in laboratory animals, and this is something called cross-sensitization. In the drug abuse world, you may have heard of this within the context of someone who is dependent on one drug might have a heightened sensitivity to become dependent on another. So for instance, there are studies that suggest that if you're um, dependent on you know, nicotine, it could be a gateway to harder drugs. And so we can measure that in our laboratory animal models by looking at locomotor activity in animals that are dependent on a drug to see if um, they also show dependence to food and also by simply looking at intake. So we can measure whether or not the animals that are dependent on a drug will show heightened food intake later on. So a lot of this work um, started off when I was actually a graduate student, and I've continued with it ever since because it's just really been such an interesting and, you know, to me, fascinating and open door area. Um, but a lot of the work that we had done up until this point had been reviewed in a nice review paper that I wrote with Bart Hobel when I was at Princeton. and so. I don't have time to go through all of the different findings that we found using an animal model that we developed. We started off looking at animals that were binging on sugar or overeating sugar. We wanted to focus on one single nutrient at first to try to understand and characterize whether or not animals could become dependent on these different criteria that I just described when the animals are over consuming sugar. And so these are summarized in this review paper. but. We, I will talk about some of the results, but if you're interested in sort of seeing everything that we've done, I'd encourage you to take a look at this. And so with respect to sugar, I can tell you that we've been able to see that the animals will show signs of overconsumption of it and signs of tolerance. And so tolerance is part of that addiction cycle that I showed earlier in that if an animal is addicted to a drug of abuse, often they need to take more and more and more of that drug in order to feel that same euphoric effect. We often see this with the case of alcohol. People usually start off becoming intoxicated maybe on like a wine cooler or two, but over time you need to consume more and more alcohol and perhaps larger quantities or higher concentrations of alcohol in order to feel intoxicated. That's tolerance. And to some extent we see that here with our rats. And so you can see on day one of access, the rats that have limited access to sugar or who are overeating it or binging on it, they are drinking more and more sugar over time. And we see that rats that have um, ad libitum access or who simply get access to sugar all the time don't show this effect. The rats that are binging on it or overeating it are actually consuming more than the rats that have it available 24 hours a day. And when we look at their first hour intake, we use the first hour of access as our gauge of how much they're binging on the food. These animals have it available for 12 hours a day, so they have a limited access schedule. But you can see that by day 21 of access, so if we do this every day for 21 days, the rats that have this limited access schedule who are binging on it will show a greater intake in their first hour intake compared to rats that have it available ad libitum and also compared to rats that just occasionally get access to sugar, maybe just on days two or three. Also, it's interesting, if you notice on the bottom panel, we don't see this happening with rats that are eating chow. And so if we just simply give rats their standard rat chow to eat, no sugar, just standard rat chow on this limited access schedule, they don't show an escalation in intake and they don't seem to show these signs of tolerance that we see like in the animals that have access to the sucrose available with their chow. So there's something special about overeating sugar, having it available for a limited time that encourages overeating, that leads these animals to show signs of binging and tolerance. And when we looked at the brains of these animals, this is where we saw something really interesting emerge. And this was really the first sort of, to me, convincing evidence that there might be something happening here that suggests that this is looking more like an addiction and less like a food. Remember I told you earlier that in the nucleus accumbens, when dopamine is released in response to a food, the effect normally habituates with time. But with a drug of abuse, dopamine is released every time the animal takes a hit of a drug. Well, it turns out when we give our rats sugar and they're overeating it, they release dopamine every time we give it to them. It's like they're taking a hit of a drug, but in this case, they're actually only just binging on the sugar. We don't see this in animals that have ad libitum access to sugar but are still drinking it, nor do we see it in animals with occasional access to sugar, and nor do we see it on the bottom graph in the animals that are overeating their rat chow. So again, there's something special about overeating sugar that's leading these animals to release dopamine in a way 
It's more like what you'd expect to see with a drug and less like what we'd expect to see in response to a standard food. So since this work with sugar, um, our group and other groups have gone on to expand and look at other types of nutrients and other types of foods. And so we're interested in modeling what happens in humans. And humans don't necessarily only overeat sugar. They tend to overeat sugar and fat combinations or the types of junk foods that we have been talking a little bit about. And so here's an example of a, um, some data that comes from another lab that's looking at dopamine receptors. And so it isn't simply the release of dopamine that's changing, but it's something about those receptors for, those dopamine, for the dopamine that is being released. It's also being downregulated. And so we see that happening with regard to D2 receptors in animals that are overeating a highly palatable food that's rich in fat and sugar. What's interesting to note is that these D2 receptors are important because they've been shown in some other studies to be associated with drug addiction. And so people using PET imaging and also in laboratory animal studies where they measure dopamine receptor binding, there's a downregulation of D2 receptors. And so it seems that this is another similarity that exists with respect to dopamine with regard to overeating of a highly palatable food and drug addiction. So in addition to the binging and the tolerance, we've also been able to assess whether or not animals that are overeating palatable food show signs of withdrawal. To do this, we can use something called the elevated plus maze. So we use laboratory rats, and we can simply put them on this apparatus. And this is the standard tool that's used to screen all different types of anti-anxiety drugs. Um, and what happens is the animals that are anxious will spend most of their time in the closed arms of the maze, whereas if an animal is not anxious, they're willing to venture out and kind of explore all areas of the maze. And what we find is that when we have animals that are of a history of overeating sugar, they will show signs of anxiety when we use this maze. And so they will spend less time exploring the maze if we simply put them into a state of withdrawal. And we can do this one of two ways. One way would be to take away their sugar. And another way is by simply giving them that drug I mentioned earlier, an opioid antagonist. And so these are animals that are just overeating sugar. If we give them a drug that's known to precipitate withdrawal in a drug addict, it seems to also precipitate withdrawal in animals that are just overeating food. So in addition to these behavioral changes, and you know, again, we've noted um, also our, our group and other groups have reported additional behavioral changes, such as depression, um, in addition to anxiety. But we've also looked at the brains of these animals. And what we see is that during this withdrawal phase, when these animals have been given naloxone to precipitate withdrawal, or when they're just simply deprived of the sugar, we see a decrease in dopamine levels coupled with an increase in acetylcholine levels. And this decrease in dopamine coupled with this increase in acetylcholine is a characteristic change that we tend to see in animals that are in withdrawal from a variety of different drugs of abuse. And so this has been reported before, where during withdrawal from alcohol, nicotine, morphine, lots of different drugs of abuse, there's a decrease in dopamine coupled with an increase in acetylcholine in the nucleus accumbens. So one of the things that came interesting to me is looking at different looking at sugars, fat, sugar, fat combinations, the types of foods people eat. But I was really interested in what was happening with these specific types of foods. If we can identify what is it about the specific type of food that the animals are being fed that might produce these changes in behavior. And one of the things that became interesting was we noted that when the animals had fat in the diet, or if there was a high concentration of fat available, they'd show these signs of, of um, tolerance and even craving, which I'll talk about in a minute, and a lot of these brain changes too. But they didn't show this opiate-like withdrawal. And so we thought that was kind of curious. And there must be something about the fat that seems to be protecting them from showing the opiate-like withdrawal. And by no means is withdrawal a necessary criteria to become an addict. People can be addicted to drugs that they aren't necessarily showing a withdrawal from. But it is usually a big part of the, the addiction cycle. So we thought it was interesting that the animals with fat didn't show signs of withdrawal. So we know that fats and sugars are different in terms of the brain mechanisms that they affect in the hypothalamus and other parts of the brain. And even pharmacologically, we know that they respond differently to treatment. And so we published some work um, a few years back looking at baclofen, which is a GABA agonist. And we also noted differences in terms of the macronutrients that it would affect. We found that baclofen seemed to be really good at suppressing intake or overconsumption of a fat but it didn't have an effect on sugar. So this suggested that there's some sort of intrinsic difference in terms of how these things are affecting 
the reward system that warranted further investigation. So the hypothesis that we are going with now is that we think that there might be something about the fat that's protecting the animals from opiate-like withdrawal. And so we know that there's a neuropeptide called galanin, which is released in response to eating fat. And if you inject galanin into the hypothalamus of a rat, the rat will go over and preferentially eat fat if it has a choice between fat and carbohydrate. There's been some interesting work that's come out of the drug abuse world that's showing that it turns out that galanin actually protects against opiate withdrawal. And so this has been some studies done in morphine-dependent rats. If they're giving galanin, it seems to protect against this opiate reward that's associated with being addicted to morphine. And so we think that this might be happening via the Krebs cycle. And so this is one of the studies that we're working on writing up right now. We've done some work looking at um, injecting galanin into the hypothalamus and then measuring the release of, or measuring Krebs levels in the nucleus accumbens. And what we find is that the animals that have galanin injected into the periventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus show a decrease in Krebs phosphorylation. And so we think that this might be the reason why they're not showing this opiate-like withdrawal signs. Similarly, if we simply give another group of rats a fat diet to eat every day and compare those to a group of rats that just get a little tiny taste of fat each day, but so we're in essence endogenously increasing galanin in these animals, we see the same effect. There's a decrease in Krebs phosphorylation coupled or with the chronic high-fat diet, high fat diet fed animals that we don't see with the acute animals. So by promoting galanin, we're in some ways able to reduce the phosphorylation of Krebs, and we're now doing some additional studies to see if this is truly the reason why these animals don't show the signs of withdrawal that we see in response to sugar-rich diets. So moving on to craving, um, as, again, if you remember that addiction cycle I showed you earlier, following the withdrawal period, which is a relatively acute period, there is a protracted period that is l much more deleterious and which usually leads addicts into relapse. And this is the craving period. And so there's been some interesting work that's been done looking at a variety of different types of overeating and how it relates to craving. This is an example of a, a paper from a, a woman who does this work. Her name is Mary Baggiano. And she's at University of Alabama. And she's looking at binge eating prone versus binge eating resistant animals. And what she finds is that the rats that are prone to binge eating are willing to cross a shock grid at a higher intensity just to get access to an M&M. And so these animals that are prone to binge eat are clearly displaying behaviors that are out of characteristic of what you would expect from an animal um, that doesn't have this condition. Similarly, we've shown in our lab that animals that are binge eating or overeating sugar are more inclined to lever press to get access to sugar and they're willing to consume more than they have after a period of sugar abstinence. And so if we give them a period of maybe two weeks of abstinence from sugar and then reintroduce the sugar, they drink more than ever before. So these are some ways in which we can assess craving in animals that have been overeating different types of palatable foods. As I mentioned earlier too, we can look at cross-sensitization between drugs of abuse. And so we've done this a few different ways. We've looked at animals that have had a history of overeating sugar. And then we simply give them a low dose of amphetamine. And we give them a dose that wouldn't normally have much of a behavioral effect on a naive rat. And what we find is that if you look all the way on the right, in response to this low dose of amphetamine, the animals that have a history of overeating sugar are hyperactive. So they're running around these locomotor activity photocell cages that we have to a much greater extent than the animals who've been maintained on different types of diets, such as ones that have ad libitum access to sugar or even animals that have been given ad libitum chow. And so there's something about this constant month-long overeating period of sugar that produces a state in which these animals are now sensitive to amphetamine, which is a dopamine agonist. And so we think that this behavior might be the result of some of the neurochemical studies I showed earlier in which the animals show changes in dopamine receptors and dopamine release. Also, we wondered just about consumatory behavior. And so if we take animals that have been on a history of overeating sugar, and instead of giving them sugar, one day we decide to just give them alcohol, we find that over time, the animals that have a history of overeating the sugar are the ones that consume the most of a 9% alcohol solution. And so anyone in the audience who does alcohol research knows that it's, it's quite a feat to get a rat to drink alcohol in any case. And so the fact that we're able to get these animals to get up to 9% and not use the sucrose fading paradigm is, is impressive. And so it 
these data suggests that there's something about the history of overeating, the history of overeating palatable foods, that's leading these animals to now become sensitive to the effects of drugs of abuse. And presumably this is because they're perturbing similar brain systems. So I also mentioned that variety was an important part of what might be happening with respect to this concept of food addiction. And so it's been shown from some of the clinical literature that variety attenuates habituation to food in humans. So the more variety of food you have available, the more you eat. And we see this if you go to a buffet. When you have lots of different choices, people tend to eat more because you're picking and choosing from all different items that are available, as opposed to if you have just one single choice, you'll eat fewer calories. Also, there had been some classic studies that had been done back in the 1990s in which Jacques Lemagnon had reported that he saw that animals that were maintained on a cafeteria-style diet, which is this, this is a diet in which we give the rats all these different foods to eat all at the same time. They can pick and choose whichever foods they like. That when he found animals maintained on this diet that became obese, they would show signs of opiate-like withdrawal. So this is really one of the first classic indications that food could produce signs of withdrawal. So there had been hints in the literature that there's something about maybe having a variety of foods available that could play a role in this. And so we thought this would be interesting to look at. So we did this experiment where we gave all of our rats um, these foods to eat. And I must say that this is the last time you'll ever see a study like this out of my lab because the graduate students told me they each gained about five pounds from having all these <laughs> foods lying around the lab so we can't do these studies anymore. Um, so we gave these foods to our rats and what we found was that of course a subset of them became severely obese and we call these the cafeteria diet induced obese animals. We also had a control group that just had laboratory chow available. And then we measured dopamine in these animals in response to amphetamine. And so we gave these animals a dose of amphetamine and looked at their dopamine release. And what we saw was similar to the behavioral finding that I just showed you with respect to the locomotor activity in response to amphetamine. Here, when we give amphetamine, the animals who have a history of being on a cafeteria diet are releasing more dopamine in response to that amphetamine. What I think is really interesting, though, comes next. We then decided to give them food to eat. And so you can see here that when we gave the animals a lab chow meal, we first introduced at the first arrow a lab chow meal. The animals that had a history of being on the cafeteria diet, they still ate the lab chow because they were hungry, but they didn't release dopamine in response to it. And so you can see that there's no rise in dopamine levels until we gave them the junk food back. And so when we reintroduced the cafeteria diet, they ate even more, and they started to release dopamine in response to it. So something about being obese and being on this diet of a variety of different palatable foods has again changed these animals' brains in a way that now they no longer respond to the taste of just standard rat chow. It seems that they need the palatable junk food type foods in order to release dopamine. So I want to move into now talking a little bit about some of the work that's been done in humans. And this is an example of the D2 receptor binding that I talked a little bit about earlier. Um, this is a slide I borrowed from a colleague, Jean Jack Wang at Brookhaven. And it really shows how we can go from the rat to the human very easily. And so on the right, you can see that's an example of an obese Zucker rat. And you can see compared to a normal rate rat that there's a decrease in dopamine receptor binding in the animals that are overweight. And these studies have also been done in macaques. And then finally, there's been studies that have been done in humans. And so this decrease in dopamine receptor binding, again, is one of these criteria that has been shown in humans to be seen in drug addicts. And again, we're, we're limited in terms of the types of neurochemicals we can measure in humans just because of the technology. We can't measure dopamine release, but we can measure dopamine receptor binding. And so this is um, pretty good in terms of uh, drawing the similarities in terms of dopamine. This is about as efficient as we can get at this point in humans. So there's been some work that's gone on based on some of the animal studies that have been done to try to identify whether or not humans show signs of addiction to food. And so what they've done is to take a lot of the criteria that we described in terms of how we measured addiction in our rats, but simply adapted it to food and adapted it to humans. 
And so there's been a scale that's been developed by um, Kelly Burnell's group up at Yale. It's called the Yale Food Addiction Scale. And it's a simple assessment that can be given. And it simply asks questions about the way people feel about food. And it's really modeled off of these DSM criteria that have been used to classify people as having substance dependence. There's also been some more work that's come out of their group looking at neural correlates of food addiction. And so they've published some studies simply to validate the scale, and other people have published with this scale. It's relatively new. It came out in 2009, but it's been in several papers in several different research groups already. But Brownell's group also more recently looked at an fMRI study in people who had also been given the um, Yale Food Addiction Scale. And what they found was that there's increased activation in brain reward pathways that correlated with scores on the Yale Food Addiction Scale. So it seemed that using this scale, the more addicted you were to food, the more dependent or the more activation you were showing in reward-related brain regions using fMRI. There's also been some more studies that have now gone a little bit deeper to assess what type of groups might exhibit signs of food addiction. And so there's been a few different studies that have come out recently. And again, these are very recent because a lot of this has really just only recently been able to be characterized because of the development of the scale. But there have been some data that suggests that food addiction as a construct might be most apparent in a group of patients that is obese with binge eating disorder. And this one particular study found that 57% of people who were obese with binge eating disorder showed signs of food addiction. Also, um, there's been other studies that have suggested that the relationship might not exactly be linear, though. And so it might not necessarily be that the more obese someone is, the higher their food addiction score is going to be. Um, in some sense, it might be that the food addiction score and relationship between BMI is not going to map onto one another exactly in a linear relationship. Um, so it might be that the food addiction is associated more so with the symptom symptomology in that it can be detected in normal weight, overweight, and underweight people but it seems to be most apparent in people who have binge eating disorder or some type of disorder that's associated with binge eating. Finally, as this might relate to prader willi syndrome, there isn't a lot of research out there, but I think it's coming. There's been a nice paper that was actually published um, a year or so ago by um, some colleagues of mine at University of Florida who were assessing whether or not food addiction and cues could be detected in patients who have prader willi syndrome. So now that we have the scale and some more technology available, perhaps this is something that could be detected in this population as well. So there are some important questions. I know I've thrown a lot of data at you and, and described a fair amount in this brief period of time, but it's important to note that this idea of food and addiction and the overlaps that might exist, it's controversial. There's actually a fair number of people out there who don't think we should be talking about food addiction and relating it to obesity for a variety of different reasons. And if you're interested in reading about that debate, I've recently been having it with a few um, colleagues in Nature Neuroscience. So there's the paper that you can uh, review if you like, and I'd be happy to email it to anyone who'd like to see it. But there are valid arguments as to why we might be careful about considering using the term addiction and relating it to obesity. And I'll say a few more words about that in a minute. So the important questions that arise, we have a lot of data that have been generated over the past few years, but there's still a lot more that we need to know. The questions about what models are best to use for assessing addictive-like responses to food. I showed you about five or six different animal models tonight, you know, using binge eating, overeating of different types of foods, junk food, whether or not the animals are obese or lean, lots of different things that are going to eventually give us diverging results. And so it's important that we develop sort of a unified way or understand what's the best model to be using to measure this construct, or should we be measuring it across a variety of different constructs? That's really the question. Also, I'm most interested in understanding the brain mechanisms associated with specific types of nutrients that people overeat. Um, and so to that extent, we're doing and continuing to do our work to try to understand what is it about the types of palatable foods that are affecting the brain downstream of dopamine in terms of not just the release and the receptors, but we're trying to get at this trans uh, the transcription factors to try to understand what is it about these foods that's promoting these changes in dopamine. Also, there's interesting work that can be done on pharmacological treatments for this type of hedonic overeating, and we're doing some work in this area right now. It's going to be different than simply giving an appetite suppressant. People who are eating because they like to eat don't need an appetite suppressant. They're not eating because they're hungry. They're eating because the food tastes good. So this is getting at a whole other area in which we need to think about treating pharmacologically. 
Also, something I think that is key is the terminology. I've thrown the term addiction around pretty loosely tonight just because for simplicity. But in reality, it's actually something that people who are doing work with people who are addicted to drugs don't really use that much. The term addiction has a negative connotation and that's one of the criticisms of talking about food addiction is that if we're calling people food addicts, it could be considered to be um, detrimental and they might not be as accepting of hearing about this type of work. So we need to come up with a better term than food addiction or another way to describe these overlaps that we're observing between overeating of highly palatable foods and changes in the brain that resemble what one would see if someone is dependent on a drug of abuse. Also, we need to note that there is a fine line between rewarding and reinforcing an addictive. Lots of people out there try cigarettes or drink alcohol or engage in other behaviors and they aren't dependent on them or addicted to them in a way that's maladaptive. Same thing with food. Lots of people out there can eat certain types of foods and cakes and cookies and whatever they like and not have a maladaptive relationship with them. And so this is an important thing to understand because as you are probably imagining, there are policy and political implications that come along with the idea of food could be addictive. And then finally, um, it's important for us to continue to do work on understanding the clinical implications of the construct of food addiction. What are the groups that might meet the criteria for uh, food addiction? Who are the people that should be targeted in terms of maybe developing treatments? And where can we gauge our research in the future? So finally, I'll conclude with a, um, this is actually a, a graph that's taken from a colleague's paper, Amanos Pathos, and he really nicely summarized the different DSM criteria for substance dependence and laid out the evidence that's been seen both in humans and in animals with respect to food. And so it's a nice summary of the findings so far. But the point is that most of the DSM criteria for substance dependence have been found with animal or human studies as they relate to food. So there are questions that still remain about the construct of food addiction and how we should apply to the study of obesity or other types of disordered eating. But it's important to note that this is a relatively young field. It feels old to me because that's the only thing I've ever studied. But in reality, it's really only been the past few years that other labs have kind of picked up on this. And there's been a lot more studies that have been published. Um, and we're now seeing clinical studies, which are you know, of utmost importance. And so there's still a lot more to do. And so I think that we'll be hearing a lot more about these overlaps in both brain systems and also behavior in the coming years as they relate to um, obesity, overeating, and addiction. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, of course, and also thank the people in my lab and my collaborators over the years, and also thank the funders who've given us some generous donations to do this work. Thank you. I'll take any questions.